We'll recess tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Pardon? I think we'll be fine if uh, this witness and the next witness will go together. This is a shorter witness than the second witness. Uh, we do. We do go tomorrow. It should be the vote tomorrow. It's not the vote. Judge, we could do both of these people by 2 o'clock tomorrow, or we can for sure do this witness with a couple of fillers tomorrow. That's your call. I'm just, you know, just want to set a schedule. Okay, we'll, we'll uh, go ahead and do this this witness, and we have a matter of offer. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll do this witness tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Thank you, Honor. If, if, uh, if I may, uh, the witness is a forensic uh, audio specialist. Uh, he has evaluated some of the audio recordings in this uh, matter to provide uh, clarification and enhancement. As part of that, uh, and as part of his training, uh, he has been trained to listen to audio clarifications and enhancements and give an interpretation of those. The uh, defense is asking that the jury be able to view a transcript of his interpretation of those recordings uh, to at least uh, either be shown uh, with the appropriate video portion or to be viewed by the jury during the appropriate video version. Uh, don't think it's necessary for those transcripts to go back to jury room, but as an aid uh, to let the jury understand, uh, understanding also that the jury is the final arbiter of what they hear and what they don't hear, and we have filed a motion to that effect, it's a motion to use transcripts, uh, and I would point the court for the South Carolina law in particular to State v. Winkler, uh, uh, 698 SE 2nd 602. Uh, and that is, uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor, it's going to be a South Carolina site, uh, 368 South Carolina 574. All right. So it's a state. Your Honor, to begin with, uh, I'm not exactly sure that we have all of this witness's uh, things. Uh, we received two audio files a while back. We listened to them. We don't have any objection to his expertise or his enhancement of the audio or anything like that. What we do object to and what we, we believe the defense is planning on doing is having him testify as to what the witness, the person is saying on the enhanced audio. We do not think that that is a proper subject for expert opinion. Certainly he is an expert, certainly he can enhance uh, an audio, certainly he can enhance verbal portions of that audio that are in English, but it is up to the jury to determine what is being said there. It is up to the lawyers to argue what is being said there. But when you are putting something, a recording that is in English in front of a jury, that is not something the subject of expert opinion. All of these jurors speak English. They can draw their own conclusion as what as what is being said in, in the, the audio. And the whole premise of 702 is that scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge will assist the trier of fact to understand the evidence 
then expert testimony is, is, is appropriate. It is our position that he is not necessary for the jury to understand that particular evidence uh, to begin with. Transcripts also are dangerous. Uh, and we would cite Martinez v. State, uh, a, a Florida State uh, case, 761, Southern Second and 1074, which kind of outlines the danger of transcripts and gives you a, kind of a, a um, uh, summary of the federal, the federal jurisdictions that have, have addressed the issue. And the issue is one of suggestion. And because when you suggest to a jury what something say what something says, then they're going to start listening to it with the understanding of that is what it is. And we know this personally from listening to these things ourselves uh, prior to trial. Is somebody you would listen to this? You couldn't understand what it was said. If somebody came and suggested to you that that's what it said, and you said, "Yeah, well, I guess it could say that." And then somebody else may come in later and say, no, it says this. And then you say, well, yeah, maybe it says that too. But the point being, this is not something that an expert needs to testify to. Uh, and it, it, is, it is not the subject of expert testimony. It invades the province of the jury, and we do not think it should be allowed. Of course, it doesn't. And also, as, as, a, as an additional ground, like I said, we are, I've see, received two WAVE files, uh, audio files. That is all we've received. I have not received anything regarding a, a, a visual presentation or transcripts. So you want to give the jury a transcript and the state hasn't seen it? Your Honor, uh, we don't plan on giving them a transcript for this portion of it. If the court were to allow us to use a transcript, we would provide it uh, in the means of uh, our uh, visual presentation in, in Chirons, like the, uh, like the state did with their presentation of quotations. And so the state would have a chance tonight uh, to review that, make any objections that they had, but we, we just didn't know where the court was was going to be going with this, Your Honor, and, and uh, it, it, there's not very much that's in dispute, I don't think. There are a couple of phrases that may be in dispute. Uh, their expert had Chiron on, on uh, their presentation, so uh, we just think of, as an aid to the jury when the, when, the, uh, when the video is being played, so it's in context uh, that the court uh, should consider uh, allowing that. He is uh, an expert. He, he did that for a living. He would listen to conversations and uh, give an interpretation of conversations to law enforcement personnel. And I don't believe it invades the province uh, of the jury. In the end, they had to make up their own mind to uh, what's it said in any of these circumstances. Well, I can't rule in a vacuum on um issues of a, a witness's expertise or um, the reliability of, of, of expert testimony without where there's a dispute. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, perhaps the best thing to do is proceed with this uh, witness today so that we can qualify him if the court is so inclined as an expert uh, let the jury hear his testimony if that is permitted, and then uh, once the court has heard his testimony and his qualifications and has heard what he has to present, then we could re urge the motion. Says the state. As I said, Your Honor, we did, uh, with regard to the two audio files we received, we have no prob problems with that. We have not seen anything visual. I have no idea what he's showing to the jury. This has not been provided to us. Uh, well, jurors typically. Understand that the art, lawyers can argue anything that they want to argue. 
when somebody says on an enhanced target evidence that it's the province of the jury and would invade the province of the jury. Uh, and just briefly, Your Honor, the uh, state did not present an audio uh, uh, certification or enhancement expert. Uh, there was no one qualified for that, and I think that uh, Mr. Halmore's expertise could be, could be helpful. But once again, we're more than willing to look qualifications and let him give his testimony because I don't think it becomes relevant uh, until uh, until you uh, the court has heard that and then if there uh, if there is a decision to be made it would not be incorporated would not be presented to the jury today but his product is going to be incorporated in our visual person's product and wouldn't do you want to begin with his testimony today or do you want the jury to go uh, just one moment your honor and I, I think Judge, I think we can bring the jury out and get started. And I think we can finish, actually. And I'll leave it to the court's discretion. We certainly would be willing to do it tomorrow as well. Don't want to. It would not impinge on our 2 o'clock tomorrow, Judge, but it, however, you, however you want to order, order this. Welcome back one more time. Let's see, there's a missing seat there. Are we missing someone? Oh, oh, oh there you go. Okay, I didn't see you. Right there. All right. Very good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have heard the state's case. It's now the defense's turn, and the state is calling the first witness. If you'll be resworn in the presence of the jury. testimony you shall give the jury in the court of the trial in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. I do. Yeah. 
address. David Hallimore, H A L L I M O R E. Good afternoon, Mr. Hallimore. Good afternoon. Um, what brings you to Charleston today? Well, I came to the fine city to uh, provide some clarified audio recordings to this court. And uh, what is it that you do for a living? Uh, currently, I'm a consultant. Uh, I have my own business that is involved in um, primarily clarifying poor audio recordings, um, other types of audio signal analysis, as well as audio authenticity. And what is your experience in that area? I uh, was a Houston police officer for uh, a little over 20 years, and for 19 of those years, I worked in our forensic audio video unit. Um, I there both as an officer and then as a sergeant running the unit. And uh, uh, in addition to just on the job experience, which was literally thousands of cases, um, I've also attended quite a bit of training. I'm involved in quite a few standards organizations. And also I do provide a fair amount of teaching in this area. And uh, so how many, how many years experience do you have in it? Uh, probably at this point, 20. And what does, uh, what does, what do you do? And how do you do it? Well, in a nutshell, I take audio that has different impediments in it, whether it be masking noises, you know, such as loud tones or like a siren or something of that nature that's on top of a desired signal, such as speech, and attempt to attenuate it or turn it down, make it quieter so that speech can come out and become more intelligible, more easily understood. And what specific type of training have you had in this area? Does it include seminars? It does. Does it include classroom work? Yes. And have you ever taught any courses in this uh, subject? I've taught at least 20 times. Uh, have you ever heard of the Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence? I have. And what is that? It is a uh, federally funded organization to designed to uh, promulgate uh, best practices and um, consensus type documents for uh, practitioners in the digital and multimedia evidence field. So the, it's a scientific working group on digital evidence. So uh, we, have, we have several different committees, forensic committees, um, and there's an audio committee. I was the vice chair for quite a few years, but I'm still a member of the audio committee, and we produce documents such as the best practices for forensic audio. And what, what type of work, now you were with the Houston Police Department, tell us in, in practicality how you would employ your skills with the Houston Police Department and any other departments that you work with while you were uh, active as a law enforcement officer. Certainly, uh, the unit within the department was created uh, via some state of Texas grants, so we felt we had the mandate to assist other law enforcement anywhere in the state of Texas should they need our services and uh, forensic audio is, is a relatively narrow field. Uh, granted, we are the forensic audio video lab. Video is a lot more widespread, but we still would not turn away any agency, um, big or small, throughout the state. Additionally, we would also routinely help other federal agencies uh, that, due to sometimes the turnaround times at the big federal labs, required um, some more expediency for for different investigations they were doing. So, we assisted fairly broadly. Um, and, and for my particular area, again, the, the expertise uh, focusing on the audio, it's everything from undercover recordings, you know, uh, where you send in a uh, confidential informant to go, you know, do some illegal activity and record it, to 911 calls where you're trying to hear what's happening in the background if someone calls and drops the phone and there's different things going on, um, to everything as, as routine as just interview rooms, perhaps, that were not quite properly um, wired or outfitted, and you cannot thoroughly or clearly make out everything that's being said. Okay. Um, when, you, uh, when you left the Houston Police Department, what did you do? I, I left in January of this year, so it doesn't feel like it's been that long, but um, I continued. I, I've had a side business since, I believe, 2008. Um, while I was employed with the Houston Police Department, my extra job, I could either put on a uniform and go work security in a store, which I did occasionally, but 
uh, I also would offer these services to civil litigation clients or investigators there where there was no criminal um, aspect to it uh, due to the restrictions of being a police officer and work, you know, working my day job in the criminal justice realm, um, not having that conflict of interest. So I was forbidden from doing any criminal work either for our different prosecutor or, or defense for that matter, wouldn't didn't matter. So uh, since my retirement, I no longer have that restriction. Um, so here I am today. Um, and uh, have you ever testified in court before? Uh, many times. And have you been qualified as an expert in court before? Yes, I have. And what uh, expertise were you qualified in? Uh, forensic audio enhancement, um, signal analysis. Um, I've also been qualified on uh, video enhancement, creating, creation of video stills. And uh, what, what courts have you been qualified in? Uh, it's been, I've testified over 25 times in um, different uh, state district courts uh, throughout the entire state, as well as the Houston area, which is Harris County, but I've, I've also testified in federal court in West Texas, and I've testified in uh, a couple of civil trials as well. And have you ever been disqualified as an expert in, uh, in state or federal court when offered as an expert for testimony? No, I have not. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, we'd offer Mr. Hallamore as an expert in uh, forensic audio uh, clarification and enhancement. Mm -hmm. It says the state. Audio clarification and enhancement or audio enhancement? Well, it, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, we have no questions regarding Mr. Hallamore's qualifications. All right, he is so admitted. Uh, Mr. Hallamore, when. Uh, <laughs> When you do your analysis, how do you determine the difference between voice and background sounds? Well, one of the first steps in reviewing audio is critical listening. So you're, you're just using your ears to simply say, well, does that sound like someone talking or is it a mechanical noise like a squeaky chair or you know, is it the air conditioning noise? that we normally uh, filter out, but the microphones pick up everything, and if a microphone's next to a noise source, then that's gonna be much more prominent. And so just simply listening, we all know what, generally what speech sounds like. I just like if, uh, if I were to play a, a musical instrument, a guitar, we would say, hey, that's a guitar. So there's, there's that on the bass level. Now granted, depending on how um, noisy the environment is, sometimes there can be noises that are in the environment that, that starts to sound like whispers or, or speech of that nature. And then I would go to the next step and, and look at sound represented in a graphical form on, through a different computer program. We can look at sound in multiple ways. And generally speech has a particular uh, visual appearance on how it's represented, um, it's called spectrographically, where we look at the frequencies over time and also intensity of those frequencies. So that's one of the ways we try to identify where there's speech versus where there's noise. And are there differences in microphones and what they'll pick up? Absolutely, microphones can be very directional to where you generally have to speak directly at the, the microphone element. Uh, some are what's called omnidirectional where you can set a microphone down and, and it is sensitive from all sides. And could you tell me what the cocktail party effect is? Certainly. So. When it comes to needing to clarify audio, the, uh, the best filter, I mean, and I have a tremendous number of, of um, products that are designed to, to clarify poor audio, but uh, the best product out there is, is the human brain. Um, your brain with your two ears, nice stereo. Uh, so for example, it's, it's called the cocktail party effect because you could be at a cocktail party, but you know, we could use it as an example here on, on recess if you, know, you have 10 different conversations going on amongst the folks in this room, or even if you guys were allowed to have recess right here and decide to all talk to one another. Well, a gentleman sitting up front, you know, and he's not talking to anybody, he can, he can steer his brain and say, I want to listen to these two gentlemen over here, or I want to listen to uh, this lady and this gentleman here. And he's able to do that, and, and you, we all have done it many times, you know, uh, you know eavesdropping on people, what have you, it's, it's not that difficult to do. And, and your brain is just, without really thinking about it, you just focus on who you want to hear and you can listen to every conversation individually. Um, unfortunately, the way recordings work, again, a microphone, it's dumb. It, it'll just sit there and it's gonna record everything equally to whatever degree. Now granted, you have some that are speaking louder, you have some people that the microphone's closer to, um, you know, you have noise sources that are louder, so 
uh, this microphone here, which is amplifying my voice right now, probably is not going to pick up somebody whispering on the back row back there right now. It it's just doesn't work like that. So unfortunately then, where I come in is I have to deal with this, the limitations of this recording. So number one, we have that microphone limitation, but beyond that we have the properties of the file themselves and things called compression that, that um, perhaps don't you know, record all the fidelity that was there you know, when it happened live and try to then uh, separate that, that noise, the unwanted signals from the speech and then turn up or amplify that speech to where it comes through that noise so that we might be able to understand it more clearly. And when you say uh, noise, you just mean unwanted signals? That's correct. That's the most basic definition of noise is just an unwanted sound. How do you, uh, how do you keep from creating uh, speech when you're enhancing? Can, can you create speech sounds when you're enhancing? No, it's, it's simply not possible. There, it is possible to over filter something and get artifacts or residual noise if you really are so super aggressive with trying to take out um, the offending noises. You, you actually, what's replaced is, is this, um, uh, some people describe it as a babbly brook. It, it all depends on what it was, on how it, it affects the audio. But it, in no way, shape, or form have I ever seen it be confused with speech. I mean, in this case, I certainly didn't over-process, and I'm, I'm very uh, cognizant of, of not processing things to such a degree that it's all unnatural and, and we have these additive uh, residual sounds. Are there any issues with layering sounds or layering tracks of sound in trying to do uh, forensic uh, uh, analysis of audio? Sure, well, normally you, you would not do that. Uh, again, if, if there's a question of what's being said, uh, you certainly don't want to mask it by adding another layer of sound on top of it. So, you know, in this case, there are multiple recordings um, taking place at the same time. Um, generally, you would, you would want to treat one of the, each one of those separately, uh, you know, by itself, so that the noise would be unspoiled by, you know, an additional noise that might come from, you know, an unrelated discussion, um, you know, radio traffic, for example, that is not, you know, what's going on uh, on a body-worn microphone, for example, and it, it covers it up. So generally, we would like to treat all of the different recordings separately by themselves and uh, maintain them that way. And can you explain what a body-worn uh, microphone is? Certainly. It's, uh, there's various models of them. Um, I've, I've certainly been working on recordings made from body-worn microphones for many, many, many years. Generally, the in-car camera systems in patrol cars um, have multiple audio channels that they can um, that get recorded. If it's configured properly, generally you have um, one that is inside of the actual vehicle, sometimes even two. They'll have one in the back seat just in case there are some defendants back there um, or some suspects trying to, to have a conversation. Um, and the officer himself generally has a transmitting microphone on his person. So, uh, and then that's what happens in this case. And a lot of times, again, they generally look similar to the pager. From, remember, what, I used to carry a pager a long time ago. The young whippersnappers don't know what those are, but it's a little box like this, like a really small cell phone. Um, and so that generally can be clipped to a uniform shirt, but a lot of times that's in the way. So um, most officers out of the way put it on their belt somewhere, on their duty belt. And it's simply a, a microphone that has a radio in it that transmits back to the car recording. So it's tied to the video. Now granted, of course, it has limitations of you know, distance like any radio. Um, they can only go so far, but, but that's uh, so the officer, when he steps out of his car, you know, you can, you can have the inside of the car audio, you can have the outside of the car audio. You can put them together if you like, you can separate them, but still, at least you have, wherever the officer goes, on camera or not, you have um, an audio recording of, of what he has going on in his presence, you know, what he's saying um, and what's around him. And what are the shortcomings of the body, uh, uh, body mic? You said it has range limitations? Certainly, yes. It's, it's like anything else with a, um, uh, a radio inside of it. There's, there's just, just like if you had a walkie-talkie. Um, again, same thing. It's pretty limited these days as well, but uh, everyone has cell phones. But the walkie-talkies, you know, you could get so far, and, and that's great. And if you try to go to another room, the wall's in the way, or, you know, even putting it in front of your body, Behind your body, your body is a good absorb, absorber of this uh, radio frequency RF energy. And so as you move, um, that's why you know, the old 
like television, you know, rabbit ears, you know, you try to get the best signal you can coming in. Well, the radio has to go, you know, transmit back to the car to get recorded. So if there's any obstructions or, again, just over distance, it just doesn't have the energy to make it. So the audio will start cutting out. It'll start sounding really choppy before eventually it'll just all go away. And what are some obstructions that can get in the way of a radio, uh, the body mic transmission back to the car? Well, again, certainly any building, um, just distance alone, and again, the, the body itself, I said anything that is in between the transmitter and the car. Now, granted, if you're, again, within distance, not, not an issue, but when you add, you know, that distance factor in there, again, if, if it's an otherwise an open, unobscured, no trees and foliage that also absorbs radio energy, then you'll have a greater distance line of sight than if you start, you know, going behind different objects, including the body itself. What about a, uh, a handheld mic? What's the difference between that and a body mic? Sure. The body mic is generally always on. There's, some of them have different settings that um, allow them to activate when they hear a certain volume. But uh, for the difference, primary difference between that and the, an officer's actual you know, radio that he uses, uh, which is very similar to walkie-talkie, it's effectively what they are, you, know, you have to actually key a microphone, whether you key it on the, on the main thing itself or if you have a, a shoulder-worn or, or an extended speaker microphone, you key that up and it only transmits when you're pressing the transmit button. And when you let go, it's not. So that's uh, the primary difference there. And, and generally those have a lot of a greater range and a lot more power to them and uh, things of that nature. Is it possible for a, someone making a transmission using the, uh, the handheld or the keyed mic to also have it si simultaneously broadcast on the uh, body mic? Absolutely. And why is that? Again, the, the body-worn microphone is effectively always on, and so it's, it's picking up anything that, that's uh, being said, that it can hear effectively. That microphone, that, um, the sound vibrates it, and it turns it into electrical signal, and it gets transmitted. Um, so, naturally, if, if that's you know, on your body and you're talking, then um, same thing. You're talking into your microphone. You'll, both of them will get picked up. Likewise, if there's you know, someone that has a cell phone nearby that's making a recording, you know, that would also be then in that location. So, again, it's, it's, they're not exclusive to one another. Um, you know, each device makes its own recording. And uh, can you extract audio from, uh, for example, a cell phone video? Yes. And can you analyze it in the same way you would analyze these other audio samples? Yes. Uh, in this case, uh, you were retained uh, by uh, Mr. Slager, correct? Yes, sir. And this was uh, a little later on in the process after you had retired and were not conflicted out anymore? Correct. Um, and you were paid for the work you've done in this case for Mr. Slager, correct? I was, yes. And can you approximate how much you were paid, including expenses? Uh, yeah, because it's um, a lot of my reimbursables, like my airfare and hotels and such, so it's all included. So far, it's just been a little over $8,000. And is that at your normal, what is your normal rate? No, um, so I have a, a tiered rate because, again, generally prosecutor's offices as well as public defenders, so any public money, um, they are usually have a fixed cost, so I do have a lower rate. That's 160 an hour. Um, for private entities, investigations, and criminal defense that's not a public defender's office, um, I charge 200 an hour. However, in, in this case, I, I chose to bill at my lower rate as well as actually do quite a, bill quite a few hours less than I actually work. Um, that's not because you have any favoritism towards Officer Slager, is it? No, not necessarily. I would say that after reviewing all of this, um, I certainly, my understanding is I've made a conscious decision to charge less due to the circumstances of the expenses in this case not, um, I don't think, being completely covered. So. Well, let me ask you this. Does the fact that you're getting paid in this case skew in any way your interpretation of the signals that you were asked to interpret? Oh, no, of course not. So it's right down the line, call them how you see them? Absolutely. If, if the prosecutor had retained me, you'd be hearing the same testimony right now. So uh, can you tell me what files you got and what you were asked to do with them? 
Certainly, I was provided the uh, audio from uh, Mr. Santana's video, and I was asked to, uh, to clarify, um, in particular, a, a certain point near the beginning of that, there where there was an utterance that was in question, um, uh, believed to be an utterance by Officer Slager. Um, I was also given the body microphone recordings and asked to, to clarify, um, uh, clarify that, uh, both from the interaction of Officer Slager and Mr. Scott, you know, during the traffic stop as well as after um, the, uh, the foot chase started and uh, all the way up to um, the point of uh, that the body microphone actually drops out. So uh, to understand, you were given the, uh, the body mic uh, from Officer Slager in its entirety until it drops out? Correct. But the Santana cell phone, you got the entire uh, I, file, but I were did. only asked to clarify the first part of it? Correct, yes. I think my initial work product, I uh, clarified the first 30 seconds, and then uh, my final work product, I just did the first 15 seconds. And uh, did you, as a result of that, create uh, an enhanced version of that? Yes, I did. And I'm showing you what's been, uh, what will be marked as uh, Defense Exhibit 50. showing you what's been marked as Defense Exhibit 50. Do you recognize this? I do. And what is that? That is a USB thumb drive uh, with my initials on it. And um, I placed two uh, audio files, two WAV files onto this disk. And uh, what is contained in uh, these WAV files? So one of the WAV files is that first 15 seconds of the Santana video clarified or enhanced. Again, it is the same thing. And the second file is an enhanced copy of the uh, body mic recording. Your Honor, the defense would uh, like to uh, introduce for identification defense exhibit 50 would like to uh, play the uh, associated audio. Set the state. Uh, Admit it. Um, so uh, I think the jury has seen enough to understand the context of the of the body uh, uh, microphone, and uh, one of the reasons we are having you testify today is uh, we're going to try to incorporate that into another uh, presentation that has some uh, some visual uh, with it. But uh, could we start out with the, uh, your version, the uh, enhanced uh, audio of the body mic, and could you describe where it starts and where it ends temporarily for the jury? Well, certainly, and this is the um, entirety of the body-worn microphone audio that I was provided. Uh, again, audio only, we're not gonna have a video to go along with it, it's a total of four minutes and 19 seconds. So it does begin, um, again, with the, with the traffic stop. Um, so prior to um, Officer Slager even getting out of his car. So it's gonna be, you know, again, the audio portion of the video, I believe you've already seen. And so 
I'd like to play the four minutes, 19 seconds? Sure. So I, uh, the jury, I just um, since I am the audio guy and haven't spoken to you before, I wasn't here before, if you got the instructions, um, I made a couple of adjustments to the system. Just uh, ask that you make sure that you have a good volume, you know, you have the volume up and down on your, on your headsets. So um, this will probably be a little, slightly quieter than some of the other stuff that's been played. So. Okay. And the first part of the file is uh, actually mostly silent, so we're not going to really hear anything for almost 40 seconds. Is that the end of that file? Yes, it is. And that is your uh, uh, enhanced.
enhancement of it. Correct. Or clarification of it. Yes. It was still pretty noisy. Why is that? It is, yes. A lot of people are disappointed. They think, oh, this guy came all the way from Houston. It should sound pristine. It's not the way the real world works. Um, they're in recordings that are just not made in the most ideal situation. And in this case, um, there's a lot of noise going on when someone's running. And if the microphone's anywhere near the equipment or the, the clothing, that, that loud you know, rubbing sound, it actually is, doesn't necessarily sound loud if you were there in the space, but the way it gets transferred to the microphone, those vibrations make it sound just so boomy and, and very loud. Um, so again, the, the true goal of, of this enhancement is to first, like a doctor, do no harm. Uh, we don't want to attenuate so much noise that the speech is negatively affected. We're taking any part of the speech, you know, um, and uh, through that, you have to then leave the same frequencies because you know it's voices of you know series of frequencies. Um, sometimes the obscuring or masking noises are in the same frequency space, so it's very difficult to turn one down and not affect you know the other. So therefore, uh, uh, it's best to err on the side of, of leaving noise in there as long as you're not obscuring the speech. But uh, the other processing done is to basically turn the volume up, if you will, on everything. So it's uh, similar to, to like a, your car stereo. You, know, you can take your bass knob or your treble knob. You, know, you turn your treble way up, you get the high, hissy, you know, a nice bright sound. Um, you turn your bass way up, same thing, very boomy. And likewise, we try to turn those down and get rid of some of the hiss, perhaps, or, or at least attenuate it, turn it down, and, and same thing with the lower frequency noise. So that's, that's one of the ways we try to uh, turn, turn down or, or attenuate those offending sounds while uh, <coughs> maintaining the, the speech and try to give it some clarity. And uh, towards the end of the recording, it, it certainly faded out or got less clear, uh, didn't it? It did. It got very choppy, and that's the telltale sign of uh, the um, transmitter just not making the connection back into the car. And so uh, the audio does still come through at different points. Again, there's a lot of movement going on. Um, and then it's just a, at the end, it just simply stops all together. And there's a large gap where it's not there. And actually, it comes back briefly just for a noise and then goes away again. And uh, as you look at the visual spectrum that's associated with this, does that help you uh, find parts of uh, speech that you might not immediately hear with a human ear? Certainly. Like I said, speech does have a particular pattern to it. It's, again, made up of a series of frequencies. Um, the, the technical term is called formants. So we talk about um, just like a musical instrument, which effectively is what the voice is. It has a fundamental frequency, so that's why you have some people that are a baritone versus a soprano, what have you, you know, higher or lower pitched. You know, men generally have a lower pitched voice, so that means their fundamental frequency is, is much lower than, a, than generally a female's. But along with that same, that first frequency, there's actually a whole series that go, they're called harmonics. They're, they're um, you know, evenly spaced frequencies that make up that, that utterance, whether it be a word, a, you know, you know a, just a vowel sound or, or what have you. So it, it looks differently than broadband noise looks on a, one display. You can make it look like just a bunch of snow, effectively, um, versus... Um, a tone would be a, just a solid line, a single tone. Again, there would be no harmonics. So there, there are ways to visually look at stuff. The, the voice is never a single tone, ever. You know, it's, it's not possible. I mean, we, our voice modulates, so it's always going up and down. Every word I say has multiple frequencies as I go higher and lower. So uh, it's, it's, we can certainly hear that, but yes, I'm aided by the ability to graphically display speech and allow me to focus on those areas. And can you tell the difference in, in uh, uh, different people's voices by the uh, tone or the signature that they leave? Yes, and it's much easier visually when there's more speech information. So obviously the higher fidelity or higher quality recording, much, much easier to do, and it's, it's a readily apparent. You know, you, I do not ever need to listen to something. I can literally open a file that someone gives me here and says, okay, you know, what do you think this is? And I said, well, it's definitely a, at least two different people talking by visually looking at it. Now, granted, I don't know what words are being said, anything of that nature, but 
but you can generally tell um, what's going on. Or I can say, hey, that actually looks like a musical performance because I see sustained notes and things of that nature that, that looks like music. Or I just see um, sirens have a certain, you know, up and down, well, you know, so and it's like, oh, that's a siren. Um, I don't, I haven't heard it yet. So, so certainly you can visually do that. Um, but again, you generally have to have a high enough quality to, to readily say, oh, okay. Um, because, you know, you can talk in a very high-pitched voice or a very low-pitched voice, you know, just an individual can. So it's, there is some variation within each of us. So there, uh, you were able to identify uh, two different voices at the beginning of this recording, correct? Yes. And how about at the end of the recording? Uh, there certainly, yes, was um, um, two different utterances towards the end of the recording, yes. Two different speakers. And... Uh, when, when is that in relation to the end of the recording? Leave. So again, the recording itself is uh, four minutes and 19 seconds, I believe. The, um, most of the speech on this recording is Officer Slager towards the end. But um, Mr. Scott's heard at four minutes, two seconds. And could you play the last 10 seconds of that where all the, uh, or at, at least 10 seconds leading up to where you hear two voices again? Sure. Okay, so here's a 10-second uh, clip. It, it begins with um, an utterance by Officer Slager, a couple of them, and then we hear Mr. Scott. And, um, oh, and is it possible for you to... Um, slow the audio down without changing the characteristics of the audio, that is the uh, timber of the voice or to make it cartoonish? Do you have the technology to do that? Certainly, there's the ability to um, stretch in time the audio while what's called maintaining pitch. Uh, most people are used to, if you slow something down, it starts sounding like, you know, it, you, you, the pitch goes with it and all of a sudden it sounds very, very deep. Uh, the flip side, of course, being you speed something up, it, people prefer to sound like chipmunks or very, very fast. Um, so you get the speed that increases along with the pitch. Um, in this case, uh, I, I have a tool that allows me to adjust the time. I could, could make it shorter even, but uh, to stretch out the time and maintain the pitch so it doesn't, uh, doesn't sound like chipmunks or, or like a really deep, you know, slow voice. Is it, is it always easier to interpret slow